Plastisol 101. Plastisol is the inks that we'll be using today. Uh, it's the most popular ink on a textile. Uh, we're not going to get into water base or uh, discharge. Plastisol is a mixture of PVC rosin, plasticizer, and pigment. Other components such as fillers may be used for opacity, modifiers which may be used to adjust viscosity, or components to give ink its low bleed characteristics. Plastisol inks do not air dry, and only through the introduction of heat do they become solid and wash fast. Now you'll notice too, uh, white ink is like oatmeal. There's a lot of ingredients in that. White ink, especially this time of year, as we're getting a little colder, you'll notice it's a little bit stiffer. Um, I have a neat little tool here. You can buy these at Lowe's for about $3. Uh, if you'll put this in a drill, it's made for mixing paint, this, this will loosen up the ink. White builds what's called a false body. It's like putty, but once you mix it and introduce a little bit of heat, it'll, 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 it'll warm it up as you go. It'll make it like cake frosting almost. Now you can also add soft hand. You can, you can reduce it just a little bit, but not much because it is going to affect the opacity. But I think the biggest mistake most people make is, is well, my ink's thick. I need to dump a lot of uh, thinner in there and thin it down. Uh, with, with black ink, dark inks like that, that won't be as much problem. But again, with white ink, you're going to really affect the opacity. Uh huh. Yes, sir? Good question. Uh, typically, if you do it, like I say, between 60 and 80 degrees, you're good for about two years. Now that's what the ink manufacturers say, about two years. Um, you know, a lot of times you're going to use it up way before then, but uh, if it's over two years old, it's probably getting to that point. I mean, you don't want to find out that you've printed a job and it all washes out, you know, that you should have, you know, probably recycled that ink. Yes, sir? Good question. What is the correct temperature of curing plastisol? Our next little uh, slide is very interesting. Um, at 80 degrees, at 80 degrees, we're still at a liquid stage. At 130, we are pre-gelling the ink, so you are getting a little bit thicker. 180, you're gelled. 280, partial fusion. 320 degrees, you're at a full cure. That's all we need is 320 degrees. Now, that is probably one of the hardest things to figure out. We have all sorts of tools, uh, temperature strips. We have infrared guns. Um, what, what do you all use? Um, we just kind of test it and see what works. We don't really have any specific tools. Well, in the old yeah, in the old days, what we did, you could, you could take the image like a, like a white print and you could stretch it. And, you know, not try to tear it apart, but just a gentle, gentle stretch like that. If it stretched, you had a cure. If it cracked, that was under cure. And that was the only way we had to wait to test it. Now, we have temperature strips that you can, they're adhesive, that you can run down the, uh, the, the conveyor with your shirt on it, and it'll actually change colors. Um, that's a cheap way to do it. It works pretty well. Uh, we have temperature guns. Anybody in here use temperature guns? Do you find that works pretty well? I hate the strips. Yeah, most people don't like them. Compared, uh, based on the dryer, if you're using a short dryer, it's hard to get that temperature. Absolutely, up. absolutely. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot here. What temperature have you found on that heat gun works for you? About Is it a... 20, um, I use some one-stroke heat on my uh, nylon and right. blisters that I've worked in about 365. Okay, so he said he, he gets about 320 to 360. That's what I've found. Uh, one of our techs we had a short dryer. We couldn't get it right. And that's all he uses is a temp gun. And he said if he can get at least 350 
That's the only number he's looking for is 350. That way you know your entire ink layer, you should have a full cure all the way through. So you, you're doing everything right. I've, I've only found with the temp guns possibly a little bit of variation with them over the years, you know, but I think if you have it in the exact same location, you shouldn't have an issue, you know. You look like a tough guy. <laughs> yes, sir. That's 320. Is there a specific period? No. It's like boiling water. Okay. You know? If it gets 320, it's done. You know? It is done. But that's a magic number. You know, if you can get at least 220, you know. Now, you don't want to get way over that, you know? And this is what's really kind of funny. People will call and say, man, my shirts are smoking. And, and they're still washing out. Well, that's two totally unrelated uh, situations. Shirts have sizing in them, you know, and it depends on what shirt you get. That's all that is usually is the sizing that's burning off of that or some sort of moisture or something. So that isn't necessarily, it should be cured when it gets that hot. So that, that's really not related, you know. Somebody had a question? So yes, sir? If you don't dry correctly, if you Right temperature, and you get it out like that. What's really happening with the print? It's dry outside, looks mm -hmm. like it's dry, but it's not. Okay, it looks dry, but it's not. Uh, the problem with that, when your customer takes it and washes it, typically it's going to wash out. You know, and it won't all wash out. You'll have places, and that's funny the way ink cures. You know, it'll it'll cure in in spots. And then I guess the entire garment cures, but you'll have partial washout. But the easiest way again is just stretch the image. You know, I have people that have to get that bulletproof vest look. You know, they'll, they'll literally cover the the shirt with ink, and they'll do a print flash print, and they'll pile so many layers of ink on there, and it says it's 320 degrees going through the dryer, but is that bottom layer cured? You know, that's why you really when you construct your art. You want to be careful how many layers you put on there. Um, that's, that's very important. You need to know what is that, that ink layer, you know, what is that temperature. And that's what you want is 320. And you're good, you know. Yes, sir. Sure. Sure. Uh, uh, first starting out with a flash dryer, is that possible to cure inks? You'd be surprised how many people that's how they cure their inks. Uh, when I was high school, when I was in high school, I used to put them in my mom's oven when she was out of the house, you know, so she wouldn't know that that smell in the house was because I, I put my shirts in the oven, but it really worked, you know. But uh, a flash dryer, it's exactly the same thing as a conveyor dryer. It's just stationary. You know, it's the same heat source. It's infrared, but you need to be able to, to, to work it where it's not so close that you're, you're burning the top ink layer. So you need that convection effect. That's where a conveyor dryer, you have that convection effect, whereas a flash, wire, flash dryer, you don't. So you need to find some way of, uh, you know, knowing that you got it at 320 degrees. It's slower. When you finally get a conveyor dryer, you're gonna love it. You know, because it's just instantaneous, you know, much faster. Uh huh. Absolutely, absolutely. I've gone into shops where they have uh, an outside door, and they'll have their dryer right there, and it'll have a pretty strong breeze coming in, and they can't figure out why they're not curing their shirts. That breeze is literally coming in there, and before that thing can adjust, it it, it can't compensate for that. Check so. Absolutely, absolutely. And then from morning to night, I mean, compared to temperature difference outside, I mean, you may start in the morning and it may be 30, 40 degrees, but at the end of the day, you're up to 50 or 60. It's mm -hmm. changed. Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of us may have uh, dryers just big enough to work in our space, and that's what's so important to, to definitely monitor your heat. We took uh, uh, and put a moved his dryer where it wasn't in that breeze, eliminated the problem. So if you do have airflow anywhere, it's going to cause some issues there. Yes, ma'am. Um, if you're doing print flash print, 
Mm -hmm. You have to get the first um, coat. Does it have to reach up to degrees? No. That's a great question. If you're doing a, fla a print flash print, your first coat, what, where do you want that temperature? You want it right in this area here. You want it gelled. Now, typical gel, like if we're doing a transfer or something like that, I always bring it to about 230 degrees. So if you brought it to a full cure, I've had people do that where my white ink's washing out and I know I'm curing it. Well, what this guy was doing, he was, he was printing flash and print. And I said, well, how long are you leaving the flash unit on? I don't know, you know, I don't have a clue. Well, he was literally curing that first layer of ink. You don't want that. You want it still to be in that gel state. So when you put that other ink on top of it, it accepts it, and you're getting a full cure when it goes down the uh, conveyor. But if you're anywhere near this with your, your first coats, you've sabotaged your... Uh, your design. It's not going to work. Yes, sir. Great question. Certain flash dryers are infrared. The one we'll use today is infrared. It's just a heat panel. Some are quartz. Now, quartz uses tubes. It's an instantaneous on and off. It just comes on and off when, when there's an image underneath there. It's extremely hot, extremely fast. They're expensive. You know, you're going to pay for a good flash unit like we're going to use five to six hundred dollars. Uh, quartz starts out at about four thousand dollars, but it's extremely fast. If you're doing a lot of production, you probably do want to go to a quartz flash unit. But the one we use today, the little infrared, that's as to me, that's as good as you need. You know, it works great. But that's a great question. A lot of people will go to a quartz because they just have that same design that they're doing that fast, and uh, they got to get them, got to get them flashed. It's a lot of heat. Uh, typical three-phase electrical, so you have to be able to do that. We do make one new flash unit that is quartz, the single phase. It's uh, limited to 14 by 16. It's a very small one. So if you are doing larger prints, you have to go to the larger ones that is a, a three phase. That's why the infrared works so well. You know, it's, and, and the one we use today, it's a 110. It's just like your television, you know? So no extra electrical needs for that. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a good question. This is your flash unit, yeah. and, it's, and, the, and the heat element is, well, typically with something like that, if it says 16 by 16, it should cover that, uh, an image that big, you know. Uh, I mean, it's just like a toaster, basically, is what it is, to simplify it. But uh, do you find that you're not getting a good uh, cure? I mean, can you? Oh, okay, okay. Well. Don't worry about it. Like I say, if it says it'll do a 16 by 16, you're not going to have a problem. As long as you can monitor that heat, you know, at 320, you're going to be fine. And watch your ink layers, you know. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, Mike. Can you help me? Oh, okay. How long can you leave the ink in the screen? That's a good question, too. Um, you know, you, you, you'll see down in our print shop, I've already done some test prints, so the ink's in the screen. The ink will not cure until it reaches 320. However, uh, I like to not leave it in there over the, over the day, you know. Like if we were going to print all day today, I'd pull all that ink out and seal up the ink, clean the screens. I know places that they just leave the ink in and uh, come back the next day, you know. However, uh, you don't know how much contaminants and everything is getting in your inks, so I like to have a clean shop, you know. That just kind of bugs me, I guess. I mean, do y'all ever leave your ink in overnight? And yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, a lot of people do it. It's, it's really, it's not a big deal, you know. But uh, it just depends on if it, if it bothers you, it'll leave it out. It's not going to hurt it. Uh, I've worked in shops where we had big garage doors and we've had ink uh, positioned right there, opened up, big five gallon containers. Well, gosh, you know, you got trucks going by and everything. So it's, uh, I like to cook. It's kind of like cooking, you know. Uh, you start out with a nice clean kitchen, nice clean print shop. Everything that goes out should work out pretty well. That's a good question, though. We're going to play some with uh, this down in the uh, print shop, soft hand printing. Everybody wants a nice soft hand. And you can achieve that with several different types of ink. I like to start out with Plastisol simply because uh, Plastisol is what we always use with textile printing. There's so many additives that you can add to Plastisol to give it a soft hand, uh, to uh, extend it. Um, it's just so much easier with that. A lot of people are doing water base. Water base is just like a dye. You can't even feel it. Water base is a whole different ball game. You need a whole different stencil system. Your, uh, your, your emulsion is different. Uh, it wants to dry on the screen instantly. It's, it's a, it takes a whole lot of patience to get water base down. Um, I don't, I'm not going to mess with it if I don't have to. You can uh, modify the viscosity of the ink with extenders and reducers to create a softer hand. Uh, a lot of times, we can go to a finer mesh. You know, if you had it on a uh, 156, and you say, man, I, I, I want a, I want a, just a softer feel, go up to a 195 or a 230, and you'll see that it changes it considerably. One thing to remember, when you do modify the ink, you are going to affect the opacity. Uh, I've noticed with a lot of the extenders that we have here, though, you can, you can really load them up real good and still get a nice white. And white is the big problem, you know? Everything you print with white, whether it be 100%, 50-50, or polyester, white is usually the issue. Yes, sir? It shouldn't, unless you, most of the extenders we use they're actually considered like a printing base, like soft hand or finesse or something like that, or soft hand clear. You can print with this. You can actually print with it. However, uh, unless you really load it up, 320 is still the magic number. You know, you shouldn't have to worry about that. Again, if you load it all up, do a print flash print, you are going to run into some issues, you know, with your, uh, with your cure. Yes, sir. I like 100%. I like, I'm old school. I like the old heavy t-shirt. We're going to be using a tri-blend today, which I didn't even know that existed. But it's a really cool, soft t-shirt. And we're using regular Plastisol with that. 100% is king to me, though. I mean, that gives you the best print. It's going to stay on top. 50-50, uh, you know, that's a cheaper shirt. Uh, with Harley Davidson, we did 100%, you know, because we knew people wanted to buy a a premium t-shirt. So 50-50 uh, works great, but again, you're not going to get as good a print. You'll notice the difference. You know, it will change the print. Okay, this is a word that I didn't make up. It's for real. Uh, thixotropic. Modern plastics are formulated to be thixotropic. It's a fancy term meaning that they are stiffer or higher viscosity in the container than when you're printing with them. I don't know if you ever noticed like white ink, once you print with it for a while, it does kind of shear a little bit easier. That's why uh, I recommend mixing it thoroughly. If you will take the time to mix it thoroughly, you bring it from that thick, thick uh, uh, viscosity to where it is, uh, it shears easier. You're just, you're just skipping that when you can mix it up real well. And that makes a lot of difference with, uh, again, white ink. That's the big problem there. Okay, we've printed the job. We're all through. We're going to reclaim the screen. And we'll actually do that down in the uh, print shop. 
Remove the ink from the screen, return it to the bucket, keep all ink containers sealed to protect from dust and contamination. Uh, use an ink degradant or screen wash to remove the remaining ink from the screen. Soak the screen with emulsion remover and scrub both sides with the, uh, with the scrub brush there. And again, rinse with a power washer. Uh, this is where I feel if you don't have hot water, especially this time of year, it is really difficult to reclaim a screen. Do y'all have hot water? You don't have, do you notice it's harder to reclaim a screen in the winter? You haven't? Uh, no, as, not as far as like the, the hazes or anything like that. Really? But with the dip tank, I mean. Yeah, I you've kind of skipped. I was a big pusher for the dip tank. I cleaned screens there before we had the dip tank. And uh, it just took, seemed like it took so much longer. The dip tank just happened sitting there for 10 minutes. Spray mm -hmm. really quick. It doesn't seem to have any problem. I've found, uh, again, in Texas, <coughs> most of the months, the water that comes out of the tap is, is, is warm enough. And again, it's just warm enough that it feels warm. Uh, I've just noticed when it gets really, really cold, it does uh, slow it down some. Uh, again, we get to the, the haze or the ghost. You use, uh, use it at that point. And we go back to the very first step. Degrease the screen and air, and, and air dry it in a frame rack if possible you're now ready to use that screen again. I can't say that enough about the, re the degreasing. Uh, the first step and the last step, as long as you do that consistently, uh, just like the CCI salesman told me, I hardly ever had to use haze remover. That, without a doubt, made all the difference in the world, uh, degreasing it properly. Yes, sir. If, if you have a haze on the screen? Absolutely. The question is, uh, if you have haze on the screen, when is the best time to get it off and will it, is it can you still get it off? Again, and, and, and I'll, I'll never change my mind on this, this is where the hot water comes in. Do you have hot water? Okay. We'll go down to Lowe's and get you a little water heater after the class, but I promise you, I promise you, uh, again, wash dishes in ice cold water and tell me how that works, you know. That's, that's where I notice that haze, uh, uh, it removes the haze so much better with hot water uh, at the reclaim. That's the last thing you'll do before you do the degrees, but, and haze removers are really tricky. We have those that they call acid, and if you leave it on too long, it'll actually eliminate the mesh. I've seen it just literally just pop the mesh. I don't use those anymore. Uh, the CCI pink stuff there, that is just enough. As long as you work it in both sides real good, hit it with the pressure washer, you shouldn't have any problems. I mean, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. That's the thing about these milder haze removers. Uh, you can actually use them more often and not worry about damaging the polyester, you know. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was just going to say what I do to make sure I have hot water. Mm -hmm. is I run a hose into my laundry room. Uh huh. See, a guy wouldn't think about that. That's, that's why it's great to have women in the class. You, you absolutely, I, 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 like I say, you have to have hot water. You have to. I don't care, you know, if 100 people say that uh, it works without hot water, I'm not going to believe you. Uh, I've just reclaimed a million screens, and uh, I've just found that hot water, NML right, I mean, hot water does work a lot better, you know. It, without a doubt, without a doubt. I mean, you can even have probably a, a marginal pressure washer, but if you have hot water, it's going to make all the difference in the world. I mean, it's just a good tip, without a doubt. Can you, after you degrease, can you dry and fit your dryer? I'll tell you what, I'm guilty of that. I've done that before, but I sure wouldn't do it again. I've ruined a lot of screens that way. I think you're compromising the mesh that way. Um, I've, I've built a similar box like we'll see down in the screen room. Uh, it's just a slat where your screen can, uh, can sit in there, you know, horizontal. That's just the best way to dry your screen. You have your air source here and your airflow. You know, it's just the best way to do it. You know, and you're, you're eliminating dust and everything else. But 
that's the best way. I put one of those heaters that you can put under your desk, you know, in the winter. I put one of those in there and a fan. It's perfect. I could, uh, I could dry a screen and have it ready probably in 30 minutes, just that way. We saw these drying racks now that, that, that you know, you can, you can put your screens in, and a lot of people will get those and just put a fan in front of them in their screen room. And he's actually got one down in our screen room, but this, this heated cabinet works so well that uh, that's just the way to, to really do it. Uh huh. Did you build it? Mm -hmm. Dry them in what way? Put them in that box. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You want to put them in the drying box. I actually had an air hose. I would, you know, blow them out real good with an air hose, so I'd get them almost totally dry before I'd put them back in the box. You know, you know, it, it's it's again, you know, it's going back to cooking. You know, you want you want all your dishes and everything to be clean and have nice uh, uh, working conditions where you promote that. I even mop my floor, you know, I mean, I kept it that clean because dust is everywhere, you know. And um, I say, I go into plenty of parent shops where they just blow the, uh, the uh, screens with a fan on the floor, so. But again, you get what you, uh, you get what you uh, put in it. Good pressure washer. We sell a pressure washer here. The cheapest one we sell, I think, is about $1,000. This one you can run 24 hours a day, put the hottest water through it, you know, and it'll keep working. Uh, a lot of people just go down to Home Depot and get one of those. Those aren't really made for hot water. So a lot of times when I go into shops, I see these little graveyards of those little pressure washers. So um, you get, get one that works, you're gonna need one. You can't just reclaim with just a, a garden hose and a, and a um, attachment there. You know, a good pressure washer is is very valuable. Yes, sir. I've got a question on if your, what process would you use if you're cleaning a screen and you're, you're wanting to store it? Say you got 10 screens you want to store, do you put the emulsion on first or no. store them in the rack? Uh, you know, it's funny. A lot of the emulsion manufacturers will say you can coat a screen and it'll be good for two weeks. I just don't believe that. Uh, I used to shoot about 40 screens a day. And uh, I found the best way to do it is, is obviously get started very early and get that process going. And what you coat in a day, or maybe even the next day, but if I was gonna store a lot of screens, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put emulsion on them, you know? I really wouldn't. Unless you're gonna use them that day or the next day. Sure, that's the way I always did it. Because, you know, when are you going to use them? If you're going to use them two weeks later, I guarantee you that, uh, you know, that degreasing is, is already worn off. There's, there's probably some contaminants on there. Unless you're keeping them in a, in a box somewhere. I had a box that I could put them in that they were confined just to that. But uh, as far as coating them ahead of time, and a lot of people will say you're wrong about that, but I just found, we did a lot of simulated process where we, we had to pick up 5% dots and a screen that's, that's a week old, I can guarantee you it's not gonna expose the same way a screen that you coated that day. I, I just don't believe that works that well. So best case scenario, um, get you a good system where you can get all those done in a day, you know?